Hey, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. We have a very special guest with us here today. This is Ricky Skaggs. Great to see you. Good to see you, Mitch. I appreciate you adhering to the memo because we, we matched we perfectly, got, don't I'm we? telling you, it was amazing. How, how did we do how that? How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, this is not the shirt I wore on Dan Rather either, just in case okay. people think that I've only got one shirt that's got little rings in it. Well, you know, Dan Rather, me is, you know. Another, another day in, at, at work. That's right, another day on video, all right. Well, we're so glad to have you here. Great to be here. You're doing a concert here in town with the Gettys, right? Yeah, uh, an Irish, uh, they're like modern day hymn writers, and they're a great, great group. They're from M Belfast, mm -hmm. and uh, they live in Nashville part of the year, And um, but uh, they're wonderful singers and songwriters, and uh, of course, they, they bring the best musicians of Ireland with them when they come, so right. some really good ones. Keith was over, uh, I guess about a year ago, and did an interview with us. Oh, here. that's great. And what an amazing guy, yeah, and oh, an he really amazing is. career he's had as well. It's amazing, yeah. That's really exciting. Yeah. But you're becoming a uh, Fort Wayne regular. You were here uh, just a couple <laughs> weeks ago doing a concert <laughs> with Kentucky it. Thunder, right? Yeah, we did, and we had a great time. We, uh, we loved it, and the guys got to come, the band got to come and, and, and uh, actually take a, uh, a nice tour here. And I decided to sleep in. I had uh -huh. had about eight days on the road and uh, and early mornings <laughs> and late nights. So I decided I was going to, uh, I had some badly needed sleep that I needed to catch up on. Right. That's right. terrible, you know, terrible excuse. It wasn't an excuse. It was a necessity. You're right. Well, you got to do that, though. Well, you got you know, to hey, catch up. You got to do 64. It. You got you to gotta have your sleep. <laughs> right. So we have had uh, a number of what I would say are child prodigies here. But you may be the, the one who started the youngest. Was it true you were singing harmony with your mother at three years old? I was. I was singing harmony with, with mom, and that's kind of what got my dad interested in getting me a mandolin because uh, uh, my dad had a brother um, that was killed in World War II, and when they were kids, they played together. My dad played guitar, and my uncle, his brother, played mandolin right. and, uh, and sang harmony with my dad. And I think my dad kind of made one of those inner vows that if you know if he ever had a son or daughter that showed musical interest at all, um, he would get him a mandolin, and that's what he did. He uh, he was working uh, up in Lima, Ohio. He was a he was a welder, and uh, there's a little pawn shop around the corner from uh, the little boarding house he was living in. You know, right, he'd right. go up there and stay for three or four days, and he'd drive home and. And uh, so he went and found this mandolin, uh, not this one, but a mandolin. Um, for like five bucks and, and brought it, stuck it in my bed about six o'clock in the morning, you know. Right. And I woke up, there it was, you know, and um, it was amazing. It was just, I fell in love with the sound of it, you know, and uh, because at three years old, you don't really have a whole lot of musical heroes, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you're just kind of listening to things that mom and dad's listening to in the, around the house. And, uh, but, um, when I heard the sound of that mandolin, then I was able to detect it and find it, you know, on, on, in the, on the radio and records and that kind of thing. And and uh, the the guy that was most famous, you know, playing mandolin at that time was Bill Monroe sure. for, for bluegrass and country music. So I uh, started really listening to him. And then uh, that was five, you know, five years old. Dad bought me that. And then uh, when I was six, uh, Mr. Monroe came to uh, a little town, a little small burg, you know, a village kind of place up above where we lived called Martha, Kentucky. And they came to the high school and uh, we went up there. I didn't even take a mandolin with me. I, I didn't take it, you know, I just went up there to see him. And and the neighbors in the hood started shouting out a little, <laughs> let little Ricky Skaggs get up and sing a song, you know. And uh, after about three or four of those, I think Mr. Monroe was ready to put a stop to it, you know. So. What can be worse? Come on, get, get this kid up here, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, stage was about as tall as this one. Ama it's amazing. Looks just, it looks a lot like it, you yeah. know. And, and so he reached down and pulled me up, uh, you know, set me on the stage and said, "What do you play there, boy?" And I said, "I play the mandolin." And uh, so he took his F5 size mandolin that really, really looked so much like this mandolin right here uh, at the time. That would have been about 19. Uh, Let's see, I would have been 61. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, man, I, I'm, I'm glad they knew one song that I knew, Ruby, Are You Mad at Your Man? Right. Because my mother had pointed her finger at me right before I left the, the audience and said, don't you sing that pinball song if you get up there. You know, and I knew that, <laughs> that song about the pinball machine and it caused me bad luck, you know, it was an old country song. But uh, thank God they knew uh, Ruby, Are You Mad at Your Man? And so I did that. and, right. and uh, 
Also did that one on Flat and Scruggs next year. It's kind of a hit for me, you know. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. It's, yeah. That, that's it's six a, and seven years old. Yeah, that's yeah. your first pro gig at well, seven, right? Yeah, With pro gig. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 But you were you were playing professionally by fifteen, right? Yeah, I was playing, uh, started playing with Ralph, uh, Ralph Stanley. Um, me and Keith Whitley met when we was about 14. And uh, we started hanging out together and playing on weekends. He, he lived in a different county, so he went to a different school than me. And, and, uh, but we'd, we'd get together and play and sang on the weekends. And um, so we heard that Ralph Stanley had a new lead singer, uh, Roy Lee Centers, and uh, we wanted to go see him. So they were coming to this beer joint over in West Virginia, across the river, you know, from Louisa, Kentucky. So we weren't old enough to get in there, so Dad took us down there, you know, and, and we did take our instruments that night, thank goodness, you know, and um, my dad should have got, he should have got royalties on the, the American Express commercial, uh, you know, don't leave home without it, you know. Because right. he, he was, I mean, he invented that thing, you know, don't, oh, now, we're not, you know, just put them in the car just in case somebody asks you. Sure. Know, be ready. And, uh, and he never was a, a Boy Scout, but he, he was always ready, so... Uh, Anyway, we, uh, Ralph's bus uh, had a flat tire and they had to fix it. And so they called the, called the uh, club owner and, well, the beer joint owner, I always say club, but truly a beer joint. And um, so um, he asked us if we, you know, and wh how he knew that we played and sang, it was crazy. I mean, we'd never been in there playing and singing before. But anyway, said, uh, you know, y'all get up and sing some, some while till Ralph gets here. It'd be great because the, the, the place was filling up with people to see Ralph. And so... Uh, so we we started singing the only songs we knew, Keith and I, and it was Stanley Brothers songs, which was kind of weird that <laughs> Ralph would come walking in, and you know, 45 minutes later, and we're singing uh, singing he and Carter's uh, songs when they were kids, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Ralph told me many times. He said, I, "I really thought they were playing the jukebox." He said, "I really thought it was mine and Carter's old stuff to hear wow. you and you and Keith play those things." And because um, Keith's brother played uh, was playing banjo. And my dad was playing guitar, and Keith was playing guitar. So, because uh, I'd play some fiddle and play some mandolin uh, then, and so, anyway, it was uh, it was quite a uh, quite a first 15, 16 years, you know, getting to work with Ralph. Uh, I guess till I was about 17, uh, right. I moved up to uh, to Washington D.C. and got a job when I was 18, and mm -hmm. kind of just I didn't really quit the business, but I just kind of um, when I left Ralph, I didn't know where I was going, what I was going to be doing, you know, I didn't know what my my next deal was, and um, and so the country gentleman wanted me to play, go to New York, and and record a record with them playing fiddle. And I thought, fiddle? You guys have never had a fiddle on your records, you know. And I shouldn't have been such a smart aleck, you know. But I, I didn't mean it that way. But right. it was like <laughs> that's really strange. Right. But they uh, they'd never used a fiddle, but they wanted to. They wanted something a little different, and they were going to be using Mike Aldridge on the dobro as well. So uh, anyway. Uh, that was for Vanguard Records, and so we did that record, and it wasn't long after that they, they wanted to hire me, you know, mm -hmm. full-time. And I was really glad to give up the job that, that I was doing. I was an assistant high-pressure boiler operator oh. at uh, Virginia Electric and Power Company, uh, affectionately known as VEPCO. Right. And uh, so, man, I've got stories about that, but we don't have time. <laughs> so did you go then from, from that group to New South? Was that next on the... It was. Yeah. It was uh, when I left uh, J.D., uh, or when I left uh, uh, the country gentleman, uh, uh, J.D. had called me while I was still living in, in, uh, in northern Virginia mm -hmm. and uh, said Tony was going to be leaving, or uh, Larry, Larry, Tony's brother, Larry Rice, was going to be leaving, and they needed a mandolin player, you know, and a tenor singer. And um, I thought about it, and I told J.D. then, I said, well, I'd like, I'd like to do more singing because in the country gentleman I'm playing fiddle, and not really getting to play mandolin, and I'm, I'm not really getting to sing harmony because they, they got all the harmony covered, you know. Uh, and so, um, but I said, just know that I want to, me and Keith want to do a band together. So me and Whitley had been talking for years that we wanted to do our own band sometime, sure. you know, we left Ralph. And um, so he said, well, that's fine. Just come stay here as long as you want to, and we have to leave, that's fine, you know. So I thought, well, yeah, that'll be good. Right. So I moved to Lexington, Kentucky, and t took a job with J.D., and it was... It's one of the best things I ever did musically, uh, getting to work with Tony Rice um, every night. And, and we, did, uh, we did, I think it was six nights a week, um, we played, um, I, I guess maybe five nights a week. I think we had Sunday and Monday off and uh, went back on Tuesdays. But uh, good Lord, we played four shows a night. Wow. 
to the same audience, so you couldn't just be, you know, uh, uh, recycling songs. Right. You know, you right. <laughs> had to have enough material, you know. And that was about the time that we uh, we recorded the, uh, uh, the the new South record that uh, for Rounder that was uh, so ex incredibly popular, uh, you know, in so many groups' uh, beginnings. Uh, young, young groups heard that record and uh, because Tony was such a dynamic guitar player and lead singer and um, of course we'd hired Jerry Douglas by then sure, you right. know to come because uh, JD didn't really want to, uh, to to have anything other than than us four you know and I and, and some of the songs that, that that we were rehearsing on and working on to, to, to do on the record I said JD I said man that would be really great to have have Dobro on some of that and he's like ah, you know and uh, <laughs> I, I said you ought to, we ought to think about getting Jerry Douglas, you know. I said, he'd been playing with, you know, me and, and the country gentleman. I said, he's really, really good, you know. And uh, he said, well, all right, well, maybe one or two, you know. And uh, well, we get up there, and Jerry just comes in, just, you know, real humble and everything, you know, and starts playing on the songs. And, okay, well, that's good. Uh, well, let, let's play that other one, you know. That we, and he played on that one. Then he ended up playing on, like, like six or seven more songs, you know, right. and he just really made a made a place for himself, you know, because uh, his rhythm playing was so great, you know, when I, because I was, you know, a mandolin, you know, when, when you know, when, uh, is the two and the four, I mean, it's the snare drum, you know, of, of the of the beat, you know, and uh, bass is playing one and three, mandolin chop is two and four, and so, you know, when when I was playing a solo, Tony's kind of playing more like ones and threes, you know, on the guitar, and JD's kind of rolling, you know, with the banjo, and you kind of miss that, miss that drive, you know. Right. And uh, so, anyway, uh, Jerry playing that two and four rhythm on that dobro was just like, man, that's just the stank. It was right, great, right. you know. It was so so good, you know. And uh, so that was a that was a great thing because you know uh jerry and i had known each other and he came and lived with me for for a while you know me and my my wife uh, lived with us for a while when when he first moved to you know to dc and and uh we've just been friends he's one of my oldest friends you know and sure. we've been friends uh for all these years since uh god 70 73. All right now that's awesome yeah that's awesome yeah and then boone creek uh, boone creek right after that yeah um you know um I kept talking to Whitley, you know, of, man, are you ready to do a group? Well, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm working Jimmy Goodrow right now. And I said, oh, okay, okay, well. So anyway, long story, we never got, to, we never got together with, with a band. But I really did want to, to start a band. I, I, you know, I had it in the back of my mind because when Tony left to go to California and work with David Grisman, with the Dave Grisman Quintet, when he left and moved, moved out of town, um, I hated it so bad um, because, I mean, I, I hated leaving J.D. having to replace, J, uh, you know, Tony, having to replace me singing, playing mandolin and singing tenor. So he had to find a lead singer. He had to find a tenor singer. And then, of course, Jerry uh, left, you know, when we put the group together. And uh, so I felt sorry for J.D., you know. Sure. I mean, that, that's just, that was a hard thing. But... I mean, he was, you know, he, he thinks on his feet, you know, and I mean, he, he had he had a great band together in, you know, two months. I mean, they, sure. they were doing great, you know, but uh, so we put Boone Creek together and and uh, and travel all over the country. And and that was a that was another really influential group because we were trying to take old old bluegrass tunes and uh, just kind of giving them a shot of insulin or something mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know just trying to kick them up a little bit you know and try to do some different arrangements you know on them and that kind of thing and uh, so you know it worked and then of course uh, Wes Golden was uh, the lead singer in that band and uh, and um, Vince Gill was there for for, uh, for a minute or two and um, but uh, Wes was a really good songwriter and wrote most all the the new material that we were doing and so we had some new things but we had a lot of cool old things that we were doing you know and, and um, and while I was in D.C. working with a country gentleman, I'd met Emmy Lou Harris and, and uh, Linda Ronstadt met him. Same party one night. Uh, John Starling was a ear, nose, and throat specialist at J Walter Reed, you know, and, and he was in a group called The Seldom Seen right. uh, with John Duffy, an old ex-country gentleman member, you know. And uh, so 
uh, John would invite me over if they were going to have a picking, you know, over at his house. And so I went over there one night and brought my fiddle mandolin, and and um, I had no idea who was going to be there, you know. And uh, so I knew Linda Ronstadt was working the cellar door. I didn't get down there to see her, uh, but I, I came over a little later, and uh, and so she comes in, and Lowell George, uh, she was dating him at the time with little feet, and so uh, he he came in, and uh, we sang and did some, you know, some Stanley Brothers songs, some Lubin Brother things, you know, and she really loved the, um, she loved the encyclopedia of old music that was up in my noggin. Right, you know, right. She, she loved that and uh, loved to sing those harmonies and, you know, wanted me to show her how to do certain little, little twists and turns and how to go from the singing the third up to the fifth, you know, how, how to move up there and how the, the baritone that's singing the fifth, how he would move up and sang, uh, you know, sang the third, right? You know, uh, from a low up to the third, and uh, they would switch parts because the Stanley Brothers did that so effortlessly. You know, they were the ones really that that didn't come up with that that sound. You know, when Pee Wee Lambert was in the band, um, they did, you know, Lonesome River, Angels Are Singing in Heaven Tonight, you know, uh, Fields Have Turned Brown, White Dove, all those were classics. You know, for the Stanley Brothers and. Sure. Uh, because Ralph didn't sing baritone, his, his voice was so high, he just he just naturally heard the third over Carter. And, um, and Pee Wee Lambert, you know, he had this, he had this really, really high voice. He was, a, he was like a Bill Monroe clone. You know, he had this really high voice and played the snot out of it. He had, a, he had an old 1922 Lloyd Lore hmm. that I have in my house now. Thank uh -oh, you, nice. God, thank Very you, nice. God. And uh, anyway. But that mandolin recorded all those uh, all those songs, and and uh, but they they were able to create a sound that was really theirs. You mm -hmm. know, nobody else had that. And, and to me, that's what I think of when I when I hear the words "high lonesome sound" because that was that was really uh, that really high singing. And Mr. Monroe always sung the third. Nobody sung over him. You know, mm -hmm. uh, ain't nobody going to sing over me. You know, and <laughs> and he didn't really uh, he didn't sing baritone. He didn't hear that part. You know, so. Anyway, he was he was stuck having to sing the third, you know, and would sing a lead singer to death, getting getting him up there, you know, to sing high. But um, anyway, we uh, we just absolutely loved getting to meet uh, Linda and show show her this this stuff. And then here comes this long legged, you know, beautiful lady, uh, you know, comes walking in with a J two hundred and and uh, sits down on the floor, just squats down on her knees and starts singing. And it was Emmy Lou. It was my first time to meet her. Right. And we just became instant friends, you know, and um, uh, recorded some together. And and because uh, she had just signed with Warner Brothers and uh, Brian uh, Ahern, which ended up being her husband a few years later, was uh, was her producer. Mm -hmm. And so we recorded a whole lot of stuff with, um, um, you know, with um, um, George Massenburg up in D.C. when he was up there. And um, so we recorded stuff there, and then Brian, he would want to, you know, he had the truck, the Enactron truck that was in Toronto for so long, and he moved that to out to Los Angeles, and they started recording a lot of stuff out there. So mm -hmm. I'd fly out there and do records, but ended up being in her band then from 1978, 79, until uh, August of 1980. Uh, she was about to give birth to her youngest baby girl, and uh, and now she is not a baby girl anymore, you know, <laughs> right. but, uh, but Megan, uh, Emmy's daughter, and uh, so she said, Emmy said, oh, uh, we're taking the year off. I said, okay. So anyway, that's when I moved to Nashville and got, got a record deal, got my country country record deal started because I'd, right. I'd started uh, kind of dabbling around a little bit, trying to blend bluegrass and country together. Right, right. Enough about me. How about No, that's well, you? that was actually when I first discovered you, I guess it would say, it was with the uh, Highways and Heartaches uh -huh. album. And in fact, the band I was in, we used to play Highway 40 Blues oh, and, yeah. uh, and Heartbroke. And, yeah. You know, both, both those songs, which <laughs> those were huge hits ones. for you, man. Yeah. Uh, so, so tell us, I, I guess, what, what, what is the difference in your mind between bluegrass and country? Well, um, Acoustic, definitely. The you know the acoustic element of country or of of, of bluegrass, um, it, it's based around an acoustic guitar, a mandolin, a banjo, fiddle, and acoustic bass. Right. That's the elements. Uh, long before the dobro came into it, you know, and uh, not that the dobro has not found a found a home in the music. Sure. It certainly has, 
But um, those were the traditional instruments that, that, uh, that Mr. Monroe used uh, in starting this music. And, and I, I tell people, bluegrass is, is built around a band. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's a band sound. It's band involvement. Not that country's not involved, a country band, but you rely on, you know, soloists, you know, right. with, with a bluegrass band. In country music, it's really built around a singer, a, a front man, mm -hmm. you know, a guy out front. And, and one of the things I did when I came, you know, when I came to Nashville and got my record deal with CBS is I wanted to, to be able to bring the greatness of bluegrass, bring the elements of bluegrass and use drums, piano, steel guitar, and blend those with, you know, with, um, you know, the acoustic instruments. You right. Know? And uh, so that worked, it really did. I mean, I had a lot of, uh, I took some music around town and played it for, you know, for some people trying to get a record deal, you know, back then. and and. Um, you know, people would say, you know, this music's, you know, this is not, you know, you can't sell this music, you know, and um, <coughs> and this bluegrass stuff. Why you got this banjo, you know, and right. and uh, but I kept noticing, and I and I told I told them, but they didn't want to listen. But I said, you know, if banjos and fiddles and mandolins are not earworms for commercials, you know, that, that it. it these get in people's heads. The sound of a, of a mandolin, the sound of a banjo, the sound of a fiddle, it draws your attention because it's you don't hear it a lot, right. you know, and it's got something good going for it because you you don't hear it a lot, mm -hmm. you know. Just because you don't hear it doesn't mean that it doesn't sell, you know. Why does you know? Why does American Express? Why does Mastercard? Why does all these huge companies, Chevrolet, Ford, you know, all these people? They use inst those instruments in their commercials, you know, and. Uh, so, you know, there's something they know that you don't, sir. You know? <laughs> right, and, uh, right. But anyway, uh, a lot of that, too, uh, we were kind of come coming off the heels of Emmy Lou's um, Roses in the Snow record. Um, but, but Roses in the Snow was not really, I mean, it was truly acoustic, you know. And, uh, and we did, you know, we would use maybe a kick drum or we might use a guitar case with a microphone. <laughs> Brian, Brian Ahorn was just a brainiac with coming up with really cool sounds, you know, and, right. and uh, so, but he didn't know anything about bluegrass and he, you know, he'd tell you to this day, you know, he didn't know anything about recording bluegrass, how to get the best sound, how to get, you know, how to mic it. I mean, he knew miking, but because he was brilliant at that and had, some, had the best mic collection ever. But uh, as far as uh, how to produce someone, someone's overdubs, you know, right. okay, Tony, I'm gonna take, you know, let's, let's just take this, the first part of the solo, play along and I'll take you out, you know? And, and of course that, of course we, we were doing all analog back then too. So, so it was, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, wasn't you know, it wasn't easy in and easy out. I mean, right. we were splicing tape back in those days, you sure. know? But uh, anyway, um, that was the fun part of getting to collaborate with Emmy and Brian on, on uh, the Christmas album, uh, you know, Light of the Stable, and then uh, Roses in the Snow, her bluegrass record. And Warner Brothers had a fit when she turned, <laughs> turned, you know, Roses in the Snow in. They said, what is this? Right. And she said, this is my new record. You know, and they, right. they just kind of looked at each other like, no, right. this, is, this is not your new record. It doesn't sound like luxury liner at all, no, does it? No. <laughs> and she said, yeah, this is what I want to do. Right. And uh, of course, Brian, he, you know, he backed her up 100%, you know, and Mary Martin was the lady that signed her, and she was a big, uh, a big deal mm -hmm. uh, at Warner Brothers. And so it was like, you let Emmy do what she wants to do, you know. Nice. And uh, so, and to, to her credit, you know, the, the record went, Crazy, and it and it it sold so much in bluegrass. I mean, the bluegrass people loved it as well. You know, to sure. hear hear someone that they really loved a lot. You know, s singing the music that they play with their genre of music. You know, so it was uh, it was really cool. You know, uh, those were great days and formative years. You know, sure, sure. And um, but that's uh, I don't know if I answered your question about the difference in bluegrass and country, but but uh, definitely, you know, the acoustic part 
of the of the music would be attributed more to what you'd call bluegrass. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that you can't play old time country, front porch country with a guitar, you know, on a fiddle. I mean, that's the way I grew up. My dad was singing Jimmy, Jimmy Rogers songs and, you know, George Jones and, you know, and, uh, but, you know, when you think about bluegrass, you think about Flat and Scruggs and the Stanley Brothers and Bill Monroe and right. Osborne Brothers and people like that. Uh, but when you think about country, you really do think that, you know, if you think about Merle Haggard and George Jones, Ray Price, Webb Pierce, uh, you know, Loretta Lynn, these were artists that were, that they, they were the lead front people and they had, they had a band around them. And usually if anyone was taking solos, it would be a steel guitar or a fiddle if they carried, uh, you know, uh, not too many piano solos in those days, you know. Um, and you didn't hear a lot of, uh, it, it wouldn't, you didn't hear a lot of acoustic guitar solos. I mean, you'd hear electric guitar solos, you know, maybe a little turnarounds and stuff like that, but it wasn't Albert Lee, you know, right. like what we grew up listening and loving, so. Right. But there, that's the difference to me. Uh -huh. So what was it at that time, you've mentioned so many great players, Tony Rice, Jerry Douglas, Albert Lee, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Record, uh, uh, Ray Flack played with you, and of course you as well, and, and all these people. What was it at that time that resulted in all these great players appearing? Was there something going on? You know, a lot of this was just, um, I think I was in the right place at the right time with the right friends, and um, once I got, once I got the blessing from Rick Blackburn, you know, um, I mean, I, I tell you the weirdest thing. I mean, I, I had left uh, L.A. Uh, I wasn't, I never lived out there. I still lived in Kentucky, um, but I left, uh, I left L.A. and I had like five songs. I was working on um, what ended up being "Don't Cheat in Our Hometown." Mm -hmm. uh, um, I. I had like, uh, this is the second record for Sugar Hill that I was supposed to do because I'd, I'd done uh, Sweet Temptation. I'd already done that record and had some success with it for, for an independent label. It did, it did pretty good. Uh, Could You Love Me One More Time and I'll Take the Blame. Those two, two songs were, were, uh, were good at, at, at Country Radio. I think it got up in maybe the 60, 40, 50s or 60s, something like that for an independent label and a no-name artist. It, was, it did pretty good. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I was doing the second record, and so I, I just had it in my bag. I had been working in the studio. I was coming to Nashville to work for Chet. I was going to be doing some some fiddle uh, things, uh, I think on maybe uh, Janie Fricky's record, and I was going to be singing some harmony. Uh, I'd met Chet, you know, with Brian. I think it might, might have been where I met him. And uh, anyways, Chet started using me, you know, on to, to do overdubs and, and sing some stuff. And uh, so I was coming there, and I... I'm in the back of this plane, a big old L 1011 uh, Delta. I just made the flight and I'm, I'm all the way in the back. And right before we take off, this flight attendant comes back and says, I've got a seat for you up front if you want to come up. What? <laughs> Who do I have to kill? I mean, that's three stages, right. you know. <laughs> I grabbed my bag. I didn't ask her a question. I just took off and went up there. <coughs> first class. I'd never been in first class. Well, I'd been in first class, but I walked through it. You right. know? I mean, I'd never <laughs> sat there. And uh, so I, I get up there, and I kind of have to go, you know, to the window and sit with this guy. He, you know, I'm sure he was kind of hoping he was going to have that for that that flight from L.A. to to Atlanta. And uh, so anyway, he was he was nice about it, but I threw my bag on the floor there, and, and I think I had my fiddle, you know, I put up overhead, and so I'm sitting over there, and we take off, and not too long, I put the Walkman, I got this little Walkman that I'd gotten from John David Souther, I traded him some tortoiseshell picks for it, you know, and, and, uh, and so I got my, my first Walkman, so I'm sitting there listening, you know, and, and uh, finally they start to bring us dinner, you know, and I thought, you really get to eat up here? God, this is really cool, and um, so, um, the guy said, you know, the guy says, uh, what, do you, what have you been listening to? And I said, well, it's some stuff I recorded. And he said, well, what is it? I said, well, it's country, you know. And uh, I said, my, uh, he said, what's your name? I said, Ricky Skaggs. I said, I work for Amy Lou. Oh, oh I love Amy Lou. Yeah, and I said, well, yeah. And uh, so, he, I said, I, I, I love to hear new music. I, he said, if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd love to take a listen to it, you know. 
I said, fine. So I'm giving it to him. And so I'm cutting my steak, you know, eating. And so I look over there at him and he's going like, <laughs> you know, like that, you know. And he's listening to Honey Open That Door. You know. And he pulls his phones off and uh, he said, that's you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, that could get you a record deal. <laughs> he said, that is a hit. I'm telling you. His name was Jim Mazza from, from uh, EMI Capital. Oh, nice. And um, he was on his way to Nashville. So he said, are you going as far as Nashville? I said, yeah, I am. He said, uh, well, would you mind, would you have time to bring that over to Capitol tomorrow, you know? And I said, sure. <laughs> so I get over there and all the Capitol people are waiting. Jim Moss is there, he's waiting. And uh, so play the tape, he's up rocking and dancing. And there was a song called Head Over Heels In Love With You. It was just kind of a thing that Albert played a lot of guitar on and it's on the Don't Cheat record. And uh, so, <coughs> They love it. They're ready to sign. Mm -hmm. They're offering me a deal, you know. And I said, but, you know, we have to, can, can we make a copy of this record to send to, you know, Don Grierson? He said he's our counterpart in L.A. and we, he has to, he has to agree. We, we got three labels that, you know, that have to agree on signing anyone. And I said, okay. So I go back the next day, you know, and it's just <laughs> one person in there, you know, and it wasn't the secretary, but I mean, there's one person <laughs> in there, you know, and, um, and Lynn Schultz and a great guy, just greatest guy. And he said, man, they got rocks in their ears. They can't hear <laughs> crap. You know, I mean, he was so <laughs> mad. He said, Skaggs, that is, that is, that's hip music. And he said, it's fresh and it's country, you know. It's not, you know, it's not urban cowboy. It's the real stuff, right, you know. Right. And uh, he said, you got a few minutes? And I said, yeah. He picks up the phone, dials it, and uh, Rick Blackburn, please. I didn't know Rick Blackburn. So, hey, Rick, this is Lynn. Yeah, up here at Capitol. Hey, I just heard a kid. I heard some of his music. It is fantastic. We can't sign him. Because they got rocks in their head, you know. <laughs> he said, but he'd be perfect for your label. Can I send him down? He said, yeah. You know, okay, well, he'll, he'll be right down there. Hangs up the phone. 30 minutes later, I'm in Rick Blackburn's office, the head of CBS, planning this music. Who produced this? I did. Okay. And I said, and... I don't have anything to bargain with but the music, but that's part that's a that's a deal breaker for me. You know, I gotta I wanna produce this. If you like what you're hearing, let me finish the record. Let me let me keep going, you know. And um so that's um he said after he heard all the all the stuff, he said, uh, you hungry? I said, yeah. So we go to a little place called Ireland's. It was a place that had these little steak and biscuit things. You could eat them, like, take them like aspirin, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's just like so small, you know. And uh, so we're sitting there, and he writes a record deal out on a table napkin. Hmm. Says, take this to your lawyer, you know. And I just had got an attorney, Mike Milam. He's still my attorney after four, nearly 40 years later, you know. Right. And uh, so that's that's how it worked back then. It's not like that now, but uh, that's right. that's how I got with uh, with uh, with Rick Blackburn at, at CBS. And those were incredibly great, great days for me. Uh, I think promoting bluegrass whilst bringing country music back from years ago, uh, because you know, I mean, Alabama was pretty big at the time, and and. Uh, you know, of course, Mickey Gilly, um, you know, um, just a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of girl groups that were doing, I mean, even Reba was doing more kind of pop sounding music, you know, at the time. George Strait hadn't really come out at the time. And, uh, and, and so he and I did the New Faces show together. On, we were on the same show together. So uh, it was just a, it was a new chapter. Mm -hmm. 
And so you, you asked earlier that, you know, what was happening, you know, was something happening, something happened. That was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, when I played this stuff for Bruce Bowden, Steel Player, and Ray Flack, um, they really loved it. They, 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 they wanted to be part of it, you know. And, uh, of course, Albert, when I was with Emmy Lou, he was always, you know, encouraging, you know, about my singing and, and, and my bluegrass stuff. He, he loved that. And, and I said, well, I'm thinking about trying to blend them together. And he said, oh, that would be great, you know. And who knew that later on I'd, I'd record, you know, his song Country Boy. Sure, but, right. But um, anyway, but that, that was, you know, right place, right time, and uh, right flight attendant <laughs> on the right plane, <laughs> sitting in the right seat. And uh, and being faithful to the only God. There you go. The heavenly God. Right. The heavenly Father. Meant to be. Yeah. So he, he, he orchestrated it. Right. Yeah, right. he sure did. Awesome. Awesome. You mentioned uh, one of the things that, uh, that interests me is, is the way that you're both, uh, I guess we'll say, faithful to the traditional bluegrass, but you mm -hmm. also are always looking to move things forward. And one of the interesting things that, that I've, I've seen you do is with Bruce Hornsby on piano, oh, yeah. which isn't a, a real traditional bluegrass kind of instrument. Talk a little bit about the idea behind that and how that all works out. Well, Bruce and I, um, we met at, um, it was a 4th of July, uh, big outdoor show mm -hmm. up in Horseheads, New York. And uh, me and Bruce, I was playing with my country band. He was there with, uh, with uh, Noisemakers. And, uh, and um, let's see, Judy Collins was on that date. And... Uh, uh, bye bye, Miss, Miss American Pie. Uh, Don McLean. Don McLean. <laughs> he was on that show, so that's that's, that's the that's the, that was the show, you know. And uh, so Bruce came back to our dressing room and just kind of introduced himself. He just come in and said, "Hey, man, you know," and uh, he said, "Really?" He said, "You making some noise out there, you know?" I said, "I love what you're doing." He said, uh, "Man," he said, "If you uh, if you guys want to." set in we like we like squatters you know he said we like <laughs> folks coming in and staying a while you know and uh, so i said okay well because we had we had to be at another date so we couldn't stay you know real late but uh anyway we go out there and set, stand on the side of the stage and we hear him play a song and i go hmm, maybe that one ah uh, he just tucked some <laughs> <laughs> so, some weird chord change way over here, and I thought, and, and, and the time signature changed, and, and I thought, let's wait, let's, we'll wait this one out. It was me and a, and a banjo playing kid, a friend of mine, he played everything, but uh, he was from Oklahoma, and he said, you reckon we'll find one, Chief, that we can play on? And I said, yeah, <laughs> Billy Joe, I'm sure we will. You know, so after a while, we, I think we finally, they, they did Valley Road, you know, and uh, they did another couple of things. And so we just kind of jumped out there. I had my fiddle and, uh, and Bill and Joe brought his banjo out. So that was it. And so didn't see Bruce anymore. I mean, they were still playing when we left, you know, mm -hmm. so I didn't see him anymore. I knew he came to Nashville uh, to do the um, Circle Two record, uh, Circle, Circle Being Broken. And I was on that record too. And, um, but we weren't there together, but I, but I knew he'd been there. And so we were talking, uh, you know, me and some friends were talking about it. I hosted a TV show from the Ryman for three years, three seasons, and uh, um, it was uh, TNN had it for a while. Then I think you know uh, uh, CMT took it, mm -hmm. and uh, so we we did that, and uh, and it was like I was the host, and I, I would play with most every group that came. Right. I was kind of the, the traveling, uh, either acoustic guitar, fiddle, or mandolin, or, and sang in harmony. You know, I, I loved getting to do that. Um, but what the, the whole concept of the show was, was to try to get uh, heroes out there mm -hmm. uh, to play with some of the new artists. Like Mark Chestnut got to play uh, with Ray Price. Till this day, I'm... You know, Mark still loves me for getting me <laughs> to be able to sing with his hero. And, uh, you know, um, and there was, you know, people that was singing with, you know, with Gene Watson and, and stuff like that, you know. And, and uh, oh, my God. And it was just so much fun, you know. And, and uh, so that was kind of, you know, that was kind of the, the, the concept of the show. And uh, so 
we, you know, the talent coordinator, we got to talking one day and she said, well, Bruce Hornsby's got a new record out and it's got a picture of Bill Monroe on the front cover. Him and, you know, and uh, I think it was him and uh, Charlie Parker uh, and um, uh, oh, uh, Duke Ellington was on, you know. And I said, oh man, what, what's he done, you know? And she said, well, well maybe we could get him on and, and, uh, and y'all could do something together. I said, well, I'd be great. So, uh, so anyway, we, uh, uh, I had Mark O'Connor on that night, I had Vince Gill on that night, and, and Bruce. And after that performance that we did, we, we got off and we just said, hey, you know, we got to do this for real, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, we got to do, every time we're together, we sparks fly and we, we have fun. And, and uh, so I was recording this, um, this tribute to Bill Monroe after he passed away. Uh, I, I kind of, I'm still, I'm still playing country music at that time. Still had my country band, we're still traveling, playing. And uh, so um, I, uh, you know, I wanted to get, I wanted to let the bluegrass community have the time they needed to do their tributes to Mr. Monroe. I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to butt in and elbow in and, you know, Ricky Skaggs, you know, doing his big thing. So after all those tributes were kind of over, then I decided I would do one. But I wanted mine to be a little different. I wanted mine to be a tribute from artists that had been influenced by Bill Monroe from different genres. Not just, you know, not just uh, bluegrass or not just country, but the Dixie Chicks, uh, Charlie Daniels, uh, John, uh, John Fogarty, you know, uh, Travis Tritt, Marty Stewart, you know, and Dolly and uh, people like that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Steve Warner. So, and the Whites, and we, we just, we had a great, great, great time putting that all together. But having Bruce on, we did, uh, we did um, dig, um, dig a hole in the meta, uh, lay Dar Darlin' Corey down. And um, so we came in to do that, and I think second or third take, we had it. It was like, dang, that was quick, you know? And, uh, and that's when we really said, all right, Let's do this. You know, mm -hmm. let's do a record. So we 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 put together a uh, you know a bunch of songs and had him come over my my studio and so we did it for Skag's family, my record label and and uh, and then after we went out and played that for a year or so on the road and did, did shows to to support it, uh, we started recording a bunch of shows on the road, and uh, so we just decided that. Where the, where the fire really fi falls is when we're out playing live. Right. Because we do things, we take chances out there uh, on live shows that we'd never do in the studio. And I don't know why. I mean, you'd think you'd take more chances in a studio than you would live, but you're not inspired to just look at a glass, you know. Right. Or look at someone with their head down reading a chart. <laughs> you know, that's not too inspiring. Right, right. So uh, anyway, um, we... Uh, we did this live record uh, and uh, called it Cluck Old Hen. It's an old banjo and fiddle tune that Bruce loved. And, uh, but that, uh, that was one of the, the best records that I got to be, ever got to be a part of. And, and it was just that, that combination of his driving piano playing. First time I heard Bruce play, uh, even uh, uh, like Valley Road um, on, and his original cut of that, you know. Um, hearing him play piano, he was playing this, you know, and I thought, man, he's heard, he's heard Earl Scruggs somewhere in his life right. because the, the, the rolls that he's doing sounds like banjo rolls to me. And so after we'd been together for a, while, a little while, I said, man, did you, ever, did you ever go out and see Earl? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, I loved Earl. I said, Earl, in the, you know, the review. I said, I used to, yeah, I said, me and Randy are great friends. And so he said, yeah, me and my brothers used to go bluegrass festivals over in Virginia and watch them, you know. So anyway, he just had, he just had a love for bluegrass. We, uh, me and Kentucky Thunder did a live record called Live from the Charleston Music Hall. Right. And Bruce got that record and called me. And he's, he was taking his kids to school one day. <laughs> and they were just in the car and he called me up and he had, he had, uh, uh, I think it was Black Eyed Susie. I th he had that thing on stun, and he was trying to talk to me at the same time, you know. 
And he said, that is just so bad, man. He said, that's just the baddest of all bad, you know. And uh, so anyway, I think that was the, that that really made it want to made him want to do a live record as well. Right, right, right. That's awesome. So I have to ask you, through the years, you've played with so many great musicians and uh, your band, Kentucky Thunder, always has the whole lineup is always just mm -hmm. stellar. What do you look for in a musician or what tells you that this is the right musician to add to a to a group? Well, there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I want to I want to hear what they've been playing. Mm -hmm. So nowadays I can hear, uh, you know, going to YouTube. Good Lord, you can get a, you know, five year, you know, just plan of, of uh, you know, what these guys have been playing over the years and playing with different people. And maybe not in the not in the band that they are playing in. That that sometimes will show a musician's uh, ability to think on their feet, play off the top of their head something that they may not know. Just seeing them up in a jam session or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I listen to that, and um, you know, honestly, I mean, I, I I do listen to the talent. There's no doubt about it. You know, um, but then. You know, I get them in, and I want to talk to them. I want to get to know them a little bit, you know. And um, I want to know their heart. I want to know why why they want to be here, you know. Why, why, why you know, why do you want to be here? Mm -hmm. And uh, wh when Andy left, which, uh, you know, my fiddle player, he's my nephew-in-law, you know, and he was with me like 14 years. He was such a great fiddle player, mandolin player. Right. You know. I thought, man, it's going to be so hard to, you know, to, to replace him, you know, and same way with Cody Kilby, you mm -hmm. know, when Cody left to, right. to go with the Traveling McCurries. And um, so, you know, and it's, it was so funny because when Cody left, you know, he said, man, Jake Workman, you've got to call Jake Workman. He's the guy that can take this, you know. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll uh, he said, I've got his number right here. <laughs> Cody wanted to help me so much, you know, but, but he was ready to go, you know, and, and so, so I called Jake, you know, and Jake fainted and then came to, I think, and, <laughs> but I would call him, but, uh, but I'm telling you, when I, when I met Mike Barnett, you know, because Andy had told me, you know, Andy said, Mike Barnett, he, he can take this. He, he'd be the guy. Jason Carter from Del McCurry's band called me and said, Man, if you heard Mike Barnett, he could he could he could eat this you know he could eat this job. I'm telling you, he can do it. You know, right, right. And uh, so I started looking at YouTube videos with him and Jake Jolliffe and some mandolin players like that, and they're playing Wheelhouse that was just so, I mean, it was so jazz, you know, and so so crazy. I thought, I don't know if they would really like this because we're kind of a traditional band that plays with sass, you know? Right. I mean, we love playing, playing the old classics, you know? But I tell you, there's so many young kids out there, they don't know the classics of bluegrass till they hear it from us. Mm -hmm. And we tell them it's classic. Oh, I didn't know that. You sure you didn't write that, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's, it's all this new stuff now and, and new technology, but, but uh, so uh, what I found in Jake and what I found in Mike Barnett, um, their heart they wanted to learn the old stuff they said man you're the guy mm -hmm. you're the guy that's carrying mr monroe's legacy you're carrying ralph you're carrying carter you're carrying all this music from the 40s and early 50s you know you're carrying this stuff in your heart and in your music and don't matter what you did in country music you're carrying it in there then too you know but we really we want to learn this stuff we want to you know and, and mike said i, I want to hear the fiddlers that that got you excited about playing fiddle, you know? Right. And, um, and so that just did my heart good, you know? And, and, and to see kids that were humble, you know? And, and another thing, they gotta be teachable. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you know everything and you can't take direction from me or take a, some advice or something like that, it's not that it, it makes me mad or anything like that. It's just like, I see, I see your heart. I see where you are that, that you, you don't want to. You don't want to learn anything here. You know. You just want to. You want to have a big stage. You know, and let people see you. You know. Right. And uh, but all these guys, I'm telling you, they are just. They're all humble guys. They're all for me. You know. And uh, when we when when I play better, they play better. When they play better, I play better. I mean, it's just like, it's just this love fest of you know, 
pushing guys out and, and making them play, you know. And uh, so that's what I look for. I, I look for people that, that have a teachable spirit, a kind heart and gentle, you know, and people that are not stuck up and think, hey, I'm, I'm in Skaggs band now, man. I don't have, you know. It's like, no, you do have to be nice, you know. And, uh, <laughs> right. you, have, you have to be really nice, you know. Right. And uh, because what, what you do out there reflects on me, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so there's no drinking before, you know, before a show, you know, and, and zero tolerance on any, any kind of drug. Um, and uh, that's just the way it is. And mm -hmm. That's the way it's been. And, and uh, they want to have a, a beer or a glass of wine after a show. It's fine with me, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, but, uh, you know. I, back in the country days, you know, Ray Flack and people, <laughs> other guys would, would wear my, you know, tour jacket that had my name on it, you know, up there, and, and they're just tearing up hell, you know, in a, in a bar somewhere, fussing and scrubbing with somebody, you know, and, and here I am, you know, my name's out there, you know, and it's just, and the reflection that that has, you know, mm -hmm. from, from, a, from the, a leader of the band, some people don't care. Some leaders, this, they just, they fan the flames on that, you know. But man, you know, my name is way too important to me. You know, my character is important. Uh, my life with Jesus is, you know, is the main thing. And so when I, when I, when I see someone disrespecting that or bringing shame or bringing dishonor to that, you know, they're not going to be around long, you right. know, and uh, because it's just not the right, right place for them, you right. know. And I do it when they, when, I've never, uh, most people leave because, you know, they just want to go somewhere else, but, but you know, it's rare that I've, that I fire people, you know. Uh, we, we work things out, we get along, and, and uh, we play music, play hard. Right. Yeah. Right. Awesome. One last question for you. When I have an artist here that is on the level that you're at and with all the experience and the people you've met, I always have to ask, what is it that makes a great artist? Well, I don't know. That's kind of hard. I like um, to end with a hard one. <laughs> end with a hard one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I think I've tried to be a good listener. Um, I try to listen to the audience. I try to, but I try to listen to the band. I try to listen to what they're playing, and and uh, you know, I think, I think years ago in my blue, or in my, what, especially in Boone Creek, I think once I had my own band, or or me and Jerry, had, you know, had the band. Um, I think it was like, you know, the hey man, this is ours now. We got our own thing, you know, and and I think that you know. Of course, when, when I went with Emmy, I didn't have my own band anymore. So right. I went back to being a sideman. And that was good because, I, you know, even though I was playing with one of the top names in, you know, in the business, uh, I learned a lot there, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I think just being young and, you know, immature, I think you can come off as a smart aleck, know-it-all, you know, snotty nose, you know. Uh, smarty pants <laughs> and uh, so I don't want to be that I don't, and, I, and I don't want to be that and and I don't uh, I don't think I am anymore but um, I think being a good artist you got to treat people good you know you got to treat people good you got to you know you got to you got to treat your band good you got to honor them uh, let them play. You know, one of the things that, that, I, that I used to be such a stickler for is uh, when, you know, when I had Albert come in and play on a solo or something like that or, or you know, Buddy Emmons or Lloyd Green or somebody play on something, you know, and it was, a, it was a, like a hit record. It was Howie 40 Blues or it was, you know, whatever it was. Um, I, I, not demanded, but I... I wanted the band to play that solo, like the solo, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't be Jethro Burns, you know, don't be Django on, on this, okay? L let's, let's, stay, let's stay with the melody here, you know? And, uh, and uh, man, you're blowing my groove, you know? Well, maybe your groove needs to be blowed, you know? You need to <laughs> humble yourself, son, and come under the, the hand of, of teaching, you know? But I said, look, if you prove to me that you can play those solos, 
then when you're in the studio with me, then you can play your own solo, you know. But don't, you know, don't buck up at me, you know, uh, when I ask you to do this because those people just paid 35 bucks for a ticket. They paid, you know, eight, ten bucks for either the CD or the eight track or <laughs> the album. And they've listened to that, they've listened to that CD or they've listened to that song plenty, plenty enough times that they know that solo probably better than you do melody wise. Right. So I want you to give them what they bought a ticket to come here, you know. And uh, they, they finally got that, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but that was, that's kind of some hard going there for, you know, for a few years just trying to find people that would, that was, you know, um, that was that away. You right. know. But, um, you know, I don't, I look at other artists and I, and I see how, how they've treated their, their, their audience and everything. And, you know, I haven't always been real good about going out and, and, uh, and, and visiting with the crowd or going out and signing autographs and stuff like that. I mean, we would do that at, at CMA Music Fest and, you know, they didn't even call it that back then. They, they had another name for it, you know. But in 2015, I don't know, God broke my heart. He truly did. I, I just, uh, I went through a real heart, heart change personally, spiritually, and... Um, you know, I lost about 60, 70 pounds, you know, and, uh, but in that losing weight, it was almost a prophetic picture of, I was losing, I was losing some stuff that I just didn't need to carry around, you mm -hmm. know, and a lot of it was, uh, you know, it was just me, you know, and, uh, and so after that, in 2015, I started going out after every show, I go out and I sit at the record table, CD, now I've got a book. You know, and I sit out there and I sign autographs till the last amen rings out. You know, the last person's there mm -hmm. wants an autograph. And um, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's two hours, sometimes it's three. But I stay there till it's over with. Sure. And I talk to them. I let them talk to me. I find out what's going on in their life. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> there's other, other people here. I can't, you know, but I... You know, I try to be sincere with them, and I pray with them sometimes. They ask me to pray for them. They know I'm a man of faith, and, and so I take time and pray with people, you know, out there. And, uh, and so other people, they, they don't get mad. They, they're ones in line. They're not, hey, you're spending way too much time with them people. You know, they're right. not like that, you know. So, right. um, but I think, I think that has made me a better artist I don't know if, if, you know, when you said it, what makes a good artist, I think this has made me a better artist because I've gotten, I've gotten hooked up with the audience a lot more than I used to. Uh, right. Because in the country music days, I mean, I was, a, I had a, a lot of FaceTime on TV back in those days. We're doing videos all the time and you'd hear me on, I mean, I was records on the radio and, and so it was, it was hard to go to go out and do things, you know, without just kind of, you know, getting, not mobbed, but getting, you know, getting people in a restaurant or if you go go shop, Christmas shopping with the kids, you know, it's like, or go to, you know, go to a park somewhere, you know. Sure. And uh, anyway, but I let that stuff just kind of put fear in me and, and make me kind of resent some things. And God didn't want me to be resentful, you know, about that, you know, I, I want to love people like he does, you know, and, and so I had to had to go through a, a heart change and uh, kind of a transplant, so to speak, a spiritual heart transplant. There you go. Yeah. Right. Right. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Ricky, thanks so much for spending time with us here today. It's such a pleasure to have you here at Sweetwater. Well, I need to interview next time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> have anything to say. So that's fine. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on. Oh, our pleasure. You ask, you ask good questions. Oh, thank you. We hope you'll come back soon. We'd love to uh, love to have you here for Gear Fest or one of our other events. And Planning so, on it. That'd be great. I'd, I'd love that. Awesome. Great thanks to see you. Yes, you sir. bet. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. And thank you for joining me for Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. Be sure to tune in next time. We'll have more guitars, we'll have more amps, more effects, and we'll be making lots of music. I'm Mitch Gallagher.